Hi there, and welcome to Champaign County Agriculture Today. My name is Dennis Riggs, your host for the next half hour as we explore many aspects of agricultural economics here on your channel. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm a, currently a board member at the Champaign County Farm Bureau and a fourth generation farmer in southeastern Champaign County. We have a couple of great gentlemen with us on the program today. I'm sure going to bring a lot of information to you today. Let's start off to my immediate left is Chris Hausman. And Chris, a farmer from down at Pisodum, uh, thanks for being with us today. Give us a quick background on uh, your farming operation. Well, Dennis, I've been farming full time since 1991 when my dad retired. I'm a fourth generation farmer, farming approximately 1,200 acres, corn, soybeans, and uh, I've lived there basically my entire life. Good. Hey, do you work off the farm too, Chris, or mainly farming? Is Just main mainly thing? farming. Okay. Also with us today is from uh, the FBFM realm of the world at the University of Illinois, Mr. Mitch Fruling. Mitch, uh, tell us just a little bit about yourself, where you live, and uh, how long you've been with Farm Business Farm Management. Thank you, Dennis. I came back uh, to Champaign County uh, in uh, 1993. I've been working with the FBFM Association uh, since that time. Uh, I'm an area advisor with FBFM, which means I'm in uh, every aspect of uh, those producers who I work with, currently about 120 here in Champaign County, uh, which, uh, which, in, which entitles uh, just being part of their operation from start to finish financially, clear through the operation, um, assisting them in making any kind of management decisions that they might have. What some people may not understand is what is uh, FBFM? Uh, is it a, a private agency or who's it associated with? Farm business, farm management, Dennis, has been around for about 75 years, started as a uh, um, uh, outreach of extension, uh, and now uh, since uh, since that time has been uh, has been spun off to the local cooperators uh, as a co-op to those people who they serve. Very good. Well, uh -huh. it's great to have both of you gentlemen with us today. Thank and you. Hope to get a lot of information out to the folks about farm economics. And I think what, what we'll start with is we see a lot of corn and soybeans growing out. I know the planting season as we're taping this is just wrapping up and, and there's a lot of corn and beans in the ground out there. Uh, Chris, you got to spend some money to put corn and beans in the ground. Tell me a little bit of an idea of what it costs for you to grow an acre of corn and soybeans. Well, Dennis, you're right. Um, we did just finish up with our farming planning, uh, which basically a lot of the costs have already been spent now for this crop. And we have seen historically these costs have been increasing over time, uh, especially in the corn production side of things. Uh, one of the things that is uh, very expensive this year is fertilizer costs, especially nitrogen. Here, probably three years ago, we were spending about $200 a ton for um, nitrogen anhydrous ammonia. Uh, that has gotten up to $550 a ton here recently, which has a big impact on our bottom line. Mm -hmm. Not only fertilizer costs, but fuel. I think everybody would agree that at the pump, they've seen gas prices go up, but I think people forget that that also hits the farmers quite hard too, because again, we're, we're very intense in, in energy cost, and so the fuel costs have also um, been part of that. So yes, our, our costs have went up considerably. Well, Mitch, we've actually got a slide. Slide number one talks about those input costs. Mm -hmm. What do you see as you work with farmers, uh, a large group of farmers over a large area? Uh, tell us about this chart that's on the screen and what that means. Yeah, what you'll see there, Dennis, uh, like Chris, we look at, we have a whole large array of numbers to look at. In Champaign County, we probably look at uh, 150 or 200 different operations and can analyze those numbers on a per acre cost basis. And what we've seen here is uh, fertilizer cost over the last couple of years, and especially over the last two or three years, uh, fertilizer costs, for example, $53 an acre. Fertilizer costs being that input cost for uh, plant nutrients, what the plant needs to grow, fertilizer, uh, phosphorus, potash, that's the actual plant food that it needs to grow to mature. Um, those costs are up uh, $9 an acre over the last year. And then we have chemical costs, our weed control program, our seed control program have been steady uh, since 2004, 2005. Um, other costs, um, as Chris mentioned too, his total overall costs, we look at, again at a per acre cost. Um, in 2004, those those fuel costs were $10 an acre, okay? And then in 2005, up $5 an acre. And, and, and anyone who has uh, several acres, even if they have 200 full share acres, $5 an acre adds up to it. Uh, and, and multiply that by 400, 500 full share acres, that adds up relatively fast. Well, Chris, your farming operation has changed uh, over the many years, just like everybody else's. And the days of 80 acres and one farmer and his family 
uh, running the operation uh, has definitely changed. Our slide number two shows equipment costs. And I know the ability for you to, to cover a lot of acres means you've got equipment that's replaced labor. Tell us about what equipment costs have done for you as slide number two shows us. Um, again, equipment costs, the, the machinery costs has went up considerably. As, as technology has improved, uh, combine size, planter size, tractor size, everything's increased. Uh, my, my mom and dad raised seven kids on 600 acres uh, back in the, you know, starting in the, the mid to late 40s, early 50s, and was able to raise a family. Uh, my mom didn't work off the farm, uh, but a lot of four row equipment back then. And my dad kept busy with some livestock also. but. Uh, what we have found is that as technology's improved, we were able to farm more and more acres with less labor, mm -hmm. which has allowed us to increase the size of our operations. But uh, to try to raise a family today on 600 acres without a spouse working off the farm would be almost impossible. So it, it, things have changed considerably, Dennis. And so machinery costs, going back to your original question, uh, it, it, it just makes me scratch my head each time I look at possibly trading up for a new piece of equipment. And, and myself personally, I try to manage my costs by running things a little longer, uh, trying to uh, preventative maintenance, try to do things to keep machinery going as long as I can without replacing it with new machinery. Mm -hmm. And I think also the, the size of your operation, if you can spread that over more acres, it does help in your uh, overall cost per acre. I'm sure there is a factor of, of being able to spread those costs out. Uh, but Mitch, as you see the costs that can be controlled by the farmer, are there some costs that are uncontrollable? To give us an idea of, of controllable costs and uncontrollable costs. The things we've been talking about, Dennis, are all things that we can control. We talk about fertility, we talk about seed, uh, we talk about uh, machine cost. Those are some things that uh, we can make, a, a producer can make a decision at. Uh, how much should I, how much fertility should I apply? Uh, where should I buy my seed? Uh, a big factor in our management decisions is when should I buy it? Should I buy it at the beginning of the year? Should I actually buy it at the end of the previous year for tax reasons? Those are all kind of our variable costs. There's, there's things that are fixed. And if you think about a business in town that sells lampshades or tires or anything like that, there are a whole host of fixed costs that if someone doesn't walk through the door and buy one of those things, you still have those costs that are still going. Um, insurance, for example. Interest. Our, our assets of our land base, those costs still have to be paid, whether we're owning the property or whether we're cash renting the property or whether we're, we're renting the property, all of those costs keep on going. Mm -hmm. Insurance, as I mentioned, is another one of those that keep on going whether we have a crop or whether we're raising a crop or not. Those are all our fixed costs that we have to build into our budget. Normally we'll see variable costs in an operation. Uh, when I look at a total operation like that in 2005, I can have, uh, I can have variable costs that run between $200 and $215 an acre, mm -hmm. and I can have variable costs bump up there between $185 and $200 an acre. So I can, so I can all of a sudden have $400 an acre to $450 an acre of total cost before I raise any kind of crop to have any kind of return on any kind of crop to start paying any bills. You're starting out uh, putting that across, across the number of acres that many Champaign County farmers farm, and you're talking about a sizable amount of capital that that farmer needs as they go to the field, even before the, the I, possibility of income. I like to even start, before, even to sit at the table, I have to come up with, uh, if I have 500, uh, 500 a full share acres, I have to have $250,000 of investment up front to put in a crop before I get a, a, a return on that three or four months down the road. Well, we're, we're making Chris nervous here talking about all these <laughs> costs. Sure so let's talk about the other side of the equation. We can, we've already seen that the costs are variable. It's definitely a business mm -hmm. that, that you have to stay on top of. Let's talk about the income side. Uh, most people, when they watch the commodity markets on television, they see beans up uh, five cents, uh, corn down two cents. Don't think a thing about it. But uh, Chris, as a variable cost, that means a lot to you when you watch the evening news every night. Oh, yes. Uh, markets have a major impact on our income because again it's it's yield and price that will determine what our uh, revenue will be so when when that commodity price drops it has a major impact on our bottom line 
Unfortunately, as, as Mitch was talking about cost, uh, as a producer of agricultural products, I'm not able to pass these costs on to the end user. And so I'm at the mercy of the market. And as a producer, we try to, you know, everybody tries to get the best price they can. Unfortunately, I just can't go into my elevator and say, boy, my cost of production mm -hmm. is $3 a bushel. Would you please give that to me? Where any other manufacturer can actually put a price on what they're producing and say, this is my cost, this is what I need. As a farmer, we're not able to do that. So we try to achieve the best price we can by marketing our crop as best we can. And sometimes uh, we do a good job at it, sometimes we don't. But uh, the, the price does have a major impact on the bottom line. A lot of times we hear in agriculture, we hear people talking about farm subsidies. We, we, the may, matter of fact, a lot of people off the farm thinks that a major portion of our income comes from a government payment, and there's, there's jokes to that effect, and I think it's a, a big misunderstanding. Mitch, uh, hmm. when we talk about farm income and farm payments, uh, what type of, of payments are we talking about? Where do they actually come from? Um, farm payments, direct payments, um, farm payment subsidies, those kind of things uh, are all, are all they, f they fall underneath the USDA. Mm -hmm. uh, they all fall under the USDA um, umbrella and they, uh, they all come from the Farm Service Agency. And it's a tough, it's a kind of a tough thing to get a finger on as far as where do they come from and what do they all amount to, but it really goes back to um, farm programs come back, uh, clear back to 1933, I suppose, mm -hmm. to, to the FDR New Deal. Um, and they were, they fell underneath the, uh, uh, the old Agriculture Adjustment Act of 1933 to where that was put into effect to stabilize farm income to where we could, uh, to stabilize farm income for farmers who were f going through ups and downs in, in, that, in that period where we had 65 million farmers. Mm -hmm. And that's just moved forward to today. In your averages, as you work with different farmers, is there a percent uh, of, of income that comes from payments such as those on every crop or are crops different? Our, our current program, which we're under the 2002 Act right now, uh, that that program payment was developed under a base yield and a and a base acreage, mm -hmm. so it de doesn't depend on your payment is not dependent upon how many acres of corn you plant in this particular year or don't plant or whatever kind of crop it is. You are eligible to any any producer is eligible and any landlord is eligible if they meet the requirements of uh, this program payment of this program law, which mm -hmm. was written in 2002. It's difficult to say uh, producer A gets. 10% of his income, to, and producer B gets 8%. Those are all variables, Dennis, that uh, each producer is different, just like his operations different, his farm, his his revenue from FSA can be different as well. But it's not like half the income for the farm uh, comes from, from government farm payments. N and very lot very small. Very small. It's, it's, it's in the single digits. It's in the lower single digits. Chris, as a farmer, uh, those payments do come along. They're a little bit of a help. Uh, is it possible for a farmer to survive without those payments? Definitely, Dennis. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out for the viewers is that uh, a lot of farmers do not receive government farm support payments. Uh, the fruit and vegetable industry, those individuals, a lot of the livestock producers receive no government payments. So, yes, farmers can survive without government support payments and actually I just returned from a trip from New Zealand and we studied this and New Zealand and Australia went away from all farm subsidies back in the mid 80s and they have prospered quite well but I think we need to look at farming as a global picture we're um, as as farmers a lot of our uh, grains are exported and part of the thing with uh, exporting is that there's other countries out there that have highly subsidized agricultural programs, especially the European Union. And I'm not, as a producer, ready to just totally disarm and not go away entirely from all government types of farm support payments when we have competitors 
that are highly subsidized and we need a free trade um, agreement. We need unsubsidized trade. And when everybody gets on an equal playing field, I think uh, the American farmer can compete with anybody in the world. So um, the, th these payments that come along, I guess I asked Mitch this question: uh, Does the farmer, the farm wife, the kids, uh, does the dog get a payment too? Uh, who all gets the payments on the farm program payments? You know, to follow up just a little bit with Chris there, when we think about, it's easy to think about agriculture when we look at our back window um, here in Champaign County. Mm -hmm agriculture in the United States is a vast array of, of different products and different, different entities. Um, in the south with um, those products that those folks raise and in the west, so that, that's a big wide area of different products that are raised. There's a, there's a whole, whole list of different uh, um, uh, rules that I indicated that um, anyone is entitled to a, um, F, a government payment. Uh, but there's a whole list of regulations that go with that. Part of that's payment limitations and all of that stuff that goes along with that and who can, who can qualify. Um, no, everyone doesn't get that. Just the producer, a landlord, um, if, if they can sign up their farm and follow the, the stringent rules that go along with that, those are the folks who get there that. There are a bunch of rules. There like Chris and I can both uh, five, attest to that. Uh, 515 pages of just one, one, one little, uh, <laughs> I think one I've little read aspect half of, those, of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, we have an interesting slide, gentlemen. Uh, our slide number three talks about how many costs, what the costs are for the consumer listening to our program today and how much of that comes from the farm. The question is, is a is a viable agriculture uh, important to the, the consumer as they take a look at the food dollar? Chris, what do you think about that? Oh, I, I think definitely. Uh, as American citizens, I think they enjoy one of the most safest, affordable food supplies in the world. And I think Americans have become almost spoiled over the years of being able to go to their local grocery store and, and always have an abundant amount of safe, uh, affordable food. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they tend to lose sight that as a farmer, uh, we only receive approximately 19 cents on the dollar of what uh, the consumer spends. That dollar purchase, only about 19 cents goes back to the actual producer. So I, I think the American consumer understands that uh, they have this affordable, safe food supply. and. Uh, our government farm programs help in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think it's important a lot of people uh, don't realize that many times the packaging of the item, the agricultural product they buy may cost more as it's scanned across the grocery store shelf as, uh, as the actual farm product on the inside. Yes. Um, let's say uh, we've motivated some people listening to us today that they want to start farming. They want to get out there and it actually sounds like a lot of fun to, to, to hassle with all the regulations and the economics. Uh, Mitch, what does it take to get started in a family farming operation today? Can you just go out and buy the ground and, and get rolling? Yeah, that's tough, Dennis. I, I, I kind of thought about that earlier and to, to start up from ground zero, uh, it's, a, it's just unheard of to kind of just get into this business uh, that uh, many of us have been involved with or worked with. Um, I think as I look at operations today and think about that next generation that's coming on, uh, for someone who's just starting out, uh, first of all, to answer your initial question, for some, I, I, I have, in all, in all of my years of doing this, I don't know of anyone who's just walked into my door and said, I'm going to start the business. <laughs> okay, so there's just, there's just less of us rather than more of us. Uh, but I think our biggest struggle that we face is that transition for those existing folks who are, for example, I'm sure Chris went through this with his father down to him in that transition planning. And where that used to take uh, two or three or four years when dad said, I think I'll retire in two or three years, now takes a decade for us to move that capital intensive business down to that next generation. That's our biggest struggle that uh, we face when, when those clients of ours get to that uh, 60 years. Now we almost have to have, give us up, give us a heads up at 55 years of old that you're going to retire when you're 70 because we need to get those get those things in motion to get to make that happen effectively both for son and father tax wise um, estate wise all of those things need to be in place as we kind of go through Chris, as we look out in the country, we see a lot of houses out there. We think, gosh, are those all farmers that live? Uh, give me a tour around your neighborhood. Are you surrounded by farmers, or are, are there other people that live out there in the country? Actually, in the Pasodam area, we've not experienced what maybe some in the St. Joe, Muhammad area with a lot of urban sprawl. But uh, for the most part, the we have, when 
we have mainly farmers living out in the country. We don't have a lot of urban people that's moved out there, which is fortunate in, in several regards. Um, but to dovetail on something Mitch had, Mitch had uh, talked about, about getting started with farming, one thing is that we have to build on relationships, and one of that is landlords. Uh, there might be a misconception that as a farmer, I own the land that I farm. Mm -hmm. Well, in this area, corn soybean production, I would say on average, the farmers probably only own 10 to maybe 15%, maybe 20% of the land they actually farm. So that means you have to build a relationship with a landlord and you either, you either have to crop share that uh, farm from that landlord or cash rent. And so it takes time to build these relationships with landlords, earn their trust, and that's one of the stumbling blocks of expansion into farming is being able to build these relationships with landlords uh, to have the land base needed to to start farming. So let me get this straight. We've got ag and the costs of input. We've got machinery costs and the capital intensive uh, agriculture. Uh, we've got the variables of inputs and we've got the landlords to deal with and the financial struggles of the taxes and the farm service payments. Mitch, why are these guys out there farming? This sounds like a lot to go through. What do you see from the fellows that are doing it? Why do they, why do they like farming? Well, for most of them, Dennis, it's what they've always done. Yeah. Uh, they've passed that down. They, they've uh, like Chris, uh, left, the, left the farm for just a little bit and had the opportunity to go back. Uh, it's, uh, it's their way of, uh, of, of, of making a career, making their life, uh, raising their family. And if done correctly, um, if done correctly it's, uh, and managed correctly, it can be a profitable business. But unlike, um, unlike a decade ago or 20 years ago, um, our producers have to be sharp and they have to, they have to watch they have to watch all of the variables now that um, maybe could have been uh, uh, looked over a decade ago. Uh, there's very little room. There's very little room for not uh, all the T's to be crossed and all the I's to be dotted uh, because our profitability, our margins are so small. Chris, as you uh, just plan your day and, and uh, work around the farming operation, we've talked about the markets that affect you. The weather is another variable. Uh, how, do, how does that affect your farming operation on well, a daily basis? Uh, I get kidded a lot about constantly watching the radar screens at home and constantly looking at weather forecasts because, again, Mother Nature will have the ultimate say-so in what our bottom lines uh, will be like. We do have risk management strategies. We can take crop insurance out to help weather through if, if Mother Nature doesn't send us adequate rainfall or send storms, hail, you name it. But uh, yes, uh, weather is a big key to our bottom lines and, and unfortunately we don't have a whole lot of control over that. And so this time of year, uh, farmers will be glued to uh, watching radars and seeing how rains are developing, and, and so it can be quite interesting. I tell you what, um, we, we all have friends in, in town. We all know they have jobs, they work hard, uh, they show up their job every day. Mitch, uh, on a farm, what do you see as far as the income? Is it the same every month? Is it the same every year? I get this question a lot as a farmer. How do you know what you're going to make and how do you budget that out? Uh, you know, we, our, our cash flows, our budgets are, are becoming more and more important. We're a highly intensified, a highly leveraged operations. Um, but there is no guarantee that uh, if you are into knowing exactly what your paycheck's going to be every month, that's not going to happen. Um, we budget the best that we can on, a, on an average. If our average crop over the last five years yielded um, 160 bushel the acre, for example, we do the best that we can to budget that out to see, to see exactly uh, where that might land in, a, in that given scenario. There is no monthly draw coming out. Uh, we sell grain at the beginning of the year and we pay those bills for the, ex for the, for the, for the months coming forward and we'll hopefully at the end of that period we'll have some money to live on because we have to plug in our family li living for the whole year for those operations. Go ahead, Chris. You, you got something <laughs> you got to tell me. Go right ahead. To, to add, add to that, I think what has helped a lot of farmers in this particular area is having uh, Champaign-Urbana in our backyard mm -hmm. allowing spouses to receive an off-farm income. 
uh, health benefits, for instance, health insurance, which has become a major expense. Uh, my wife works off the farm, works here at the University of Illinois, has helped tremendously in providing health insurance. And, and I think you're seeing more and more of that where farmers have taken um, off-farm income to help supplement their farm income. And that is that has uh, added a tremendous amount of stability to our to our overall bottom line. The economics of small towns have changed quite a bit. I know your town of Pasodum, my town of Broadlands or Sydney, it used to be uh, when there were more farmers, and we've definitely seen the number decrease right here in Champaign County, uh, has changed the, the structure of many of our small towns. Chris, so what's it done for your area? Our, our town in Pasodum has pretty well stayed constant. It, it has not experienced any growth to speak of. There's a lot of factors of probably why that has happened. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of our small towns are struggling. I mean, the ones that are out in the rural areas of Champaign County. Um, other towns, uh, St. Joe, Muhammad, have experienced some tremendous growth, but uh, some of the uh, outer uh, villages have struggled somewhat. So not a lot of change when it comes to our small towns. Well, in just a couple of minutes we've got left over, it's time to look into the future. I know farmers are often accused of being optimists. Uh, Mitch, as you farmers around uh, the multi-county area that you mm -hmm, work on. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the outlook for the future for the farmers? What are they thinking about? You know, I think they're probably always concerned, um, but unlike uh, a lot of businesses, they always start that year over. They they're, they're always have that next year where it seems like we can erase any mistakes that we made and get a clean slate and start that year over. Uh, our, our producers are getting better at what they do if there is such a thing. They're becoming sharper managers. Um, we're becoming uh, uh, better marketers. We have those issues that uh, face them every year, but, they, but I, I think generally they're, they're optimistic about where they're heading. Chris, what about you? You're out there uh, in the furrow, let's say, or out in the field. Uh, what are you looking for for this year and then ahead? Are there some strategies you're putting in place? I'm, I'm always an optimist, and each year, uh, like Mitch said, it's always a new year, a new beginning. Um, I think uh, for this coming year, I think the when you look at prices down the road, I think we have – an opportunity to be looking at some profitable mm -hmm. prices. I've been doing some forward selling and I'm, I'm very optimistic about this year. Again, it all is going to depend on what Mother Nature does for us and hopefully if we're blessed with some rainfall, I think we're going to have a good year even though we do have some extremely high input costs this year. Are there some new products coming along? What are agricultural uh, raw resources being used for in the future? Well, I think one of the big keys is the ethanol um, mm -hmm. explosion that's going on right now. That's something that five years ago you really didn't hear much about. And right now, ethanol is just, you turn the news on and it seems like every other day there's a story about ethanol. That can be nothing but positive to agriculture, especially here in this this area. It's fantastic. Well, as we've seen today, agricultural economics are a multifaceted area. Uh, input costs, expenses, the weather, and of course the future. A lot of variables we don't know about, uh, but it's fun as a, a fun business. And I appreciate both of you gentlemen spending your time with us today as we learn more about agriculture here on Champaign County Agriculture Today. Folks, we appreciate you being with us today. We hope that you'll tune in again next time. We have a chance to look at more issues that affect agriculture here in Champaign County and the surrounding areas on Champaign County Agriculture Today. I'm your host, Dennis Riggs. Thanks for watching.